the anti-vaccination movement has its roots right around where it should have stopped. Right around the early 19th century, where vaccinations started to become normal and widespread. Between 1840 and 1867, vaccination acts were passed that made vaccination compulsory in Britain, and this was immediately met with opposition. Anti-vaccination leagues started to crop up everywhere. They were claiming that these laws attacked personal liberty. They were the teabaggers of their day. This is a scary new technology to people. Some religious people thought it went against God. They were using cowpox pustules in the vaccine. It made people say, you're gonna turn into a cow! You're gonna be a cow! But we know now, that's a bunch of bull. After an 1853 law that made vaccination compulsory for all infants, there were riots in towns all over England. This would lead to the formation of the Anti-Vaccination League. The Anti-Compulsory Vaccination League would go on to be founded in 1867. In the United States, a smallpox epidemic was raging in the 1870s, so the state started enacting vaccination laws, and they were met with resistance. But this was the 18 1970s, so it's kind of acceptable. This wasn't 2015. But anyway, William Tebb, a well-known loudmouth British anti-vaccine proponent, visited New York in 1879, and his ideas spread throughout the country. This led to the founding of the Anti-Vaccination Society of America, the New England Anti-Compulsory Vaccination League, and the Anti-Vaccination League of New York City. To be fair, vaccinations are unique among compulsory requirements. The state is demanding that you have yourself or your child injected with something that may seem strange and dangerous to you if you're not entirely scientifically literate. As cases of smallpox began to fall, which would lead to its eventual eradication, the anti-vaccination leagues defected or went into the shadows. Many groups who opposed vaccinations also rejected germ theory, the theory that microorganisms cause infectious disease. This is the late 19th century now. This is the time of the second industrial revolution. Science at this time is making all kinds of leaps and bounds, but it's in direct competition with quack medicine, stuff like herbalism, vitalism, magnetism, all kinds of crazy stuff. Everything is confusing and unregulated. People are electrically shocking themselves, they're putting weird things in their butts, it's a big mess. Anti-vaccine sentiment runs deep in chiropractic and other alternative medicines as well. And this is where the idea would be harbored. And this is where it would wait and have a safe place to go. In the mid-1970s, there was controversy over the DTP vaccine. There was a report alleging that 36 children suffered neurological conditions following DTP immunization in the UK. At the bottom of this were groups of lawyers arguing to seek compensation. This information took off almost unchecked and started to freak everyone out. And three major epidemics of whooping cough broke out because of it. In the wake of the media hell ride, the Joint Commission on Vaccination and Immunization, an independent advisory committee in the UK, confirmed the vaccines were indeed safe. It took years for the DTP hysteria to wear off, but it finally did. Though thanks to chiropractors, naturopaths, homeopaths, and other pseudoscientific branches, anti-vaccine sentiment stayed there, brewing, bubbling, just underneath the surface. Like that one zit that just won't go away. It frothed up again and started where the anti-vaccine movement has its roots, over in England. People will claim that a lot of this can be put on the shoulders of a gut doctor from England called Andrew Wakefield. But, as was the case before, groups of lawyers were really at the heart of it. Wakefield first started to attract attention to himself when he tried to link Crohn's disease to the measles vaccine, and he published a paper in The Lancet in 1993 proposing this idea. Research was subsequently done to back it up. And as it turns out, a group of experts confirmed that neither measles nor the MMR vaccine caused Crohn's disease. This in turn attracted the attention of some dubious company. Some dubious company indeed. And they would go on to approach him with an offer that was hard to refuse. And 
more on that later. In 1998, he publishes another paper in The Lancet. This time he claims that he discovered a new syndrome called autistic enterocolitis that he found in 12 autistic children. He claimed this syndrome was linked to bowel disease, autism, and the MMR vaccine. And we know this story by now. Wakefield went on to give a press conference where he called for an end to the triple MMR vaccine and suggested vaccinations should be done in single doses instead. He claimed that the triple dose vaccine was dangerous. It was this conference that caused the big media firestorm and that resulting MMR scare, the big mess we're still dealing with today. But why? Why would Andrew Wakefield stick his neck out so far for this thing? You know, why would he take these kinds of risks? There must be something in it, right? This idea would go on to be thoroughly debunked and his name would be dragged through the mud. He'd lose his license, weird guys would talk about him on their web shows. It's just a bad situation, man. First of all, the 12 children his paper claimed to have been previously normal before MMR vaccination weren't. Three of the nine children reported to have autism did not have autism diagnosed at all. Only one child clearly had autism. Five had documented pre-existing developmental disorders, though. Eight of the children's parents blamed MMR, but 11 of these families made the allegations at the hospital. As it turns out, the patients were recruited through anti-MMR campaigners and funded by the planned litigation. According to figures released under the Freedom of Information Act, Andrew Wakefield was paid £435,643, about $672,000, plus an extra £3,910 in expenses. These funds were paid out by lawyers trying to prove that the vaccine was unsafe. The payments were unearthed by Brian Deere at the Sunday Times over in the UK. Apparently a bunch of doctors and scientists were paid off and recruited to support the lawsuit against the vaccine manufacturers. A total of 3.4 million pounds was paid out to these people. Wakefield started to work for these lawyers two years before his paper in The Lancet was published. Also, according to Brian Deere of the Sunday Times, Wakefield claimed he could make more than 43 million pounds a year from diagnostic kits for the new condition, autistic enterocolitis. The Lancet would go on to formally retract his paper in 2010, and it's been recommended that his other papers be retracted as well, or at least heavily scrutinized. Still, none of this matters because it isn't really whether they believe Wakefield or not. It's that they have a deep distrust of the medical industry, and that's for good reason, you know. After Wakefield, they went after thimerosal. Thimerosal, a preservative that was used in some vaccines to stop the growth of bacteria and fungi, was a hot topic of debate, and it was felt that this was causing autism, because everything just causes autism now. Everything. It metabolizes into ethyl mercury, not methyl mercury, which is a common mistake made by vaccine opponents. Though the preservative is safe in the amount administered, in order to get these people to shut up, it isn't used in the MMR vaccine anymore. Still, autism rates have not gone down in correlation. But if it isn't an issue with thimerosal, it's formaldehyde, or a whole slew of other issues. What you're asking people to do when they get a vaccination is you're asking them to have something that they may not know a whole lot about injected into their body, or their child's body, and this can scare people. This gets people scared and confused, and when that kind of fear is involved, they become vulnerable to charlatans that may tell them they don't have to get that scary shot, that there's a better way. This in turn compromises herd immunity, vaccines wear off, and we rely on new people to be vaccinated. That's how we beat smallpox. That's how we almost beat polio. But most importantly, the modern anti-vaccination movement is a failure of modern medicine and science as a whole. The medical industry has price gouged so many people that it's cheaper to die. The insurance companies and hospitals have made it almost impossible for certain people to get treatment without going into a lifetime of crippling debt. So when a nice man in a chiropractor's office tells you, you don't need that expensive surgery, you don't need those expensive drugs, well hell.
That sounds really good, and that's a big problem. You see, the anti-vaccine movement is really an anti-medical industry movement based on a justified mistrust of the medical industry, but we all pay for that with weakened herd immunity. Vaccines such as the MMR vaccine work. They do have side effects, but they're negligible compared to the benefits. History has proven their effectiveness. But now it appears that medicine's biggest task will be to win over the hearts and minds of every ghoulish, goblin-like soul on the planet. To which I would like to remind everyone, one simple fact. There is terror. There is terror all around you.